another very informative interview with Ed Casilia about polygamy today in the United States of America. In the media, in the money, in the power, and in the slavery. Thank you for joining us. Ed's continuing wisdom needs to be heard. I have followed this up by doing another interview with him back to back from the last one. Thank you for joining us. I am the voice behind the camera. We hadn't seen somebody actually go after, if you will, the big fish. Right. And uh, for him, even though the charges were rape as an accomplice, and even though the judge um, messed up in his jury instructions, which meant that when the case was appealed, the conviction was overturned, it was still a very courageous thing to do at that time. And we're talking about within the past 10 years. We hear this slogan all the time, don't paint polygamy with the same brush. Yet the public doesn't know that they're all cut from the same cloth, and the same brush is highly appropriate. Well, when you're dipping that brush in the same paint can, it's pretty difficult. Well, you are dipping it in the same paint can, because Clyde Mackert was married to two of my half-sisters. Tom Green's child bride, Linda, was my niece. And you can just roll the tapes forward. My literal, literal family relationship with Cody Brown, with Joe Darger. And then we come to Centennial Park, the new polygamy, unlike the rest. Tell us about Centennial Park. Centennial Park is often called the work of Jesus Christ, the, the second ward, um, or sometimes shortly they call it the, the work or the CPers. The Centennial Park Group broke off from the FLDS organization as a result of a dispute between the way the church was being run. One group wanted to have it run by a council. One group wanted it to be run as a one-person uh, one person set up in charge of the religion. The Centennial Parkers didn't like what happened and were pretty much castigated by the FLDS so they moved about three blocks away and across the border, and they're they're in the in the uh, Colorado City area. And the split had absolutely nothing to do with doctrine. The split had absolutely nothing to do with doctrine, other than how uh, the head of the church was was organized. Um, the Centennial Park group will tell you that they are the quote good place. Um, they are the ones who allow the women to get an education, to go to school, to, um, to, to have more say in the way that their lives are conducted. However, um, they come, as you say, from the same fabric where they are educated, they are, they are propagandized, they are, they are told from, again, cradle to grave, that the, the route to their everlasting salvation is through polygamy, through plural marriage. Um, you know, they, we, we attended a forum at Dixie State University here, the, which unfortunately occurred on the same day that we had some friends who participated in the forum at UNLV that was part of the Sister Wives show, so we couldn't make it to both places. So we, we went to the local one, and, you know, we had a situation that we were in the middle of at that point. We had um, suddenly blipped on the radar screen of the Centennial Park Bunch and uh, with our book plagues. And they started filing um, reviews on Amazon.com negative to the book. And they hadn't read it. Of course. Um, but they were they were writing negative reviews and placing them um, on the website, um, and they freely freely admitted so in the exchanges that we had. They attacked us on, on our Facebook page for the book, um, you know, and so we we were kind of in a bit of a struggle with them as it was. Well, we walked into the to the forum, and unknown to us, uh, it was being taped for part of the Polygamy USA series that was being done by National Geographic. And so these women, four women, come out 
take their place. It was not um, a, a debate discussion type of a situation. It was four women um, from a group, the Centennial Park Action Committee, to, to whose job is to go out and do PR and image work for, for the Centennial Park group. And they sit down at the front of the room and start talking while as they came out, two of the women immediately recognized us, Kara and I, and we had eye contact, and it was not friendly, you know. Um, there was a bit of glaring coming from them, and they went about their their spiel about how they're the good ones and how they're not associated with the FLDS, and, well, they broke off from us, and, well, we're not part of them, we don't share the same thing, and... You know, we got to a point of, of a, a Q and A session on on the uh, panel, and so I had a question naturally. I raised my hand and asked my question, and it was very interesting the way it came through on TV. Um, as they're introducing the Q and A portion, which they only allowed two questions and answers, by the way, oh. mine and one other person's, um, they're setting up the question answer thing, and they say. And the women were prepared were prepared for confrontation, and the camera hits Karen and I, and then the camera hits one of the women on the panel without any kind of identification that you know I've written them up plagues or whatever. When it was no, but in who you are, just the face. Here's the confrontation. Yeah, here's the confrontation. This mean old gray-haired man going to attack this poor young little girl, and. That's how it was presented, and the answer that was 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 given to, to the question was a very roundabout thing that took about ten minutes for them to kind of throw little bits and pieces out there that were eventually edited together um, for the answer on the show. You know, the the question and the main question that we had for them, the, the point that we had for them was, who are you? Where do you come from? Where are your roots? What are your beliefs? And what's you know, what separates you. Um, and they kept just basically saying, oh, we're different, we're different, we're different, we're not like those guys, and we think that child abuse is terrible, and all, you know, domestic violence is terrible. But they never delineated what they were, and in fact, um, one of the women during the, during the panel discussion, uh, she better have been called monologue, um, explained that, um, you know, how after going through how different they were, um, talked about the problems they had within their community when the the rescue of the, the kids in, in Yearning for Zion in El Dorado went down and, and they had eventually ended up with charges against more than 1,100 men. Um, how terrible it was because children came running into her and going... Why are they taking those people away? Why are they going to jail? What's going on? Um, and the woman said that she explained it to the children as simply being, oh, well, it's because they have more than one mommy like you. Oh, um, wow. In other words, they literally identified directly with They They identified directly with them. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, um, I found the comment to be incredibly specious. I, I you know, the children... Uh, especially young children coming in, they're not going to know what's how, how did they know what was going on? I think it was crafted. I think it was contrived. I don't think it was real. Um, and also, um, I think that they relied too heavily on news and TV reports out there. Oh, they, they're narcissistic males in polygamy love the limelight with all the women, TV, all the press they can get. It's an addiction. Yeah. The thing about Centennial Park is they have a, a very interesting way of waltzing around freedom of choice, saying they got to choose in Centennial Park their own husband. They fail to admit that, of course, we got to choose. We got to choose between Uncle So-and-So and Uncle So-and-So and, -so and, -so and maybe three choices, but you did not get to choose outside of faith. And, you and did not get to choose outside of those men that your parents or the priesthood said. And you may have a choice between only two, or you may have a choice between only one. And they skirted right around that. Well, and it, and it still requires the approval. Exactly, and they're not going to approve of somebody that they can't control in polygamy. 
and they just skirted so completely around that the same way that Cody did. Well, and again, you know, it it's all disguised as a lifestyle choice, and it's not. It is not a lifestyle choice. And if polygamy was a choice, then these men would allow other people the same choice, and there's not a one of them that would tolerate that from one of their wives. Well, that woman would be subject to eternal damnation and destruction and physical abuse and maybe even death, depending on how what the guy could get away with, and all those would be sanctioned by our bloodthirsty God. Well, and I, and I hate to bring the show back up because I don't think it's worthy of being publicized, but having watched... Um, the Sister Wives show and Cody Brown, there was a segment where they were discussing the, the relationships and the, between the women on the show. And, and it was described at one point as Cody and one of the mistresses being in the honeymoon phase still. And, you know, the look on the faces of the other women was pain. Was, yeah. It, it's. It's cruel. It's selfish. It's, it's um, you know, every time the subject comes around to him making him the center of attention or the limelight or the boss or the, as he put it at one point, the king. Um, well, it's to make him the god, and you know that. Yeah. And it's, it's just painful to watch because the others involved in, in, in this arrangement um, even if it's just for a moment, there's this fleeting sadness. Of course. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a terrible situation to watch. And that's the moment of truth you're really seeing, not the game they're forced to play. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't possibly imagine um, in, inflicting that kind of cruelty on my wife. Well, Cody says love should be multiplied. For every one of his wives is subtracted and subtracted and subtracted, and they have less and less and less of a husband. And for every one of his children, they have less and less and less of a daddy. Children spell love T-I-M-E. He can't give his women the psychological and emotional and physical and financial and intellectual care, let alone the children. There's not enough time in a day. And so his love is multiplied. Theirs is subtracted. Well, it's it's endemic of the polygamous um, culture. Although it's a very patri it's a patriarchal society, um, the the men have very little to do with with the children. That that's the woman's work. That's the sister wives, and they're going to take care. They're going to raise the kids. They're going to feed them. They're going to clothe them. They're going to take care of getting them educated. Um, y you know, my job is only to control them and get more. Right. Um, do you, do you see them playing ball with the kids? Do you see them taking the kids and hanging out and having a good time? Drive through the community and see what's happening out there. The only involvement that they have um, is ordering them around a, a, a work site. Go get this, fetch this, help build this, grab this, take that trash there, clean this site. There's no interaction. Yeah, I asked Irene Spencer one time if her sons had a good relationship with their father. And she said, oh yes, they've worked with him. They've worked with him. That was the relationship. They didn't go fishing. They didn't go out in the, uh, hiking together. They didn't have one-on-one -on -one time. They worked with him. And that was their good relationship. Yeah, and, and it's sad. It becomes part of the, the ingrained culture. Um, you can walk through um, the Walmart out here in Hurricane, you can walk through the Costco out here in Washington City on any given weekend. And, you know, you see some 12 year old strutting in front of a line of women behind him who dare not speak. Right. You know, um, wearing their prairie dresses. And somewhere in that line, maybe his mother and maybe his sister, who's 15 years old and pushing a baby carriage. And you wonder, is that? child, a sibling, or he a is, If he's 12 years old, he was just given the Aaronic priesthood, and he is above every one of those women. He is now a man, and he now knows that women are lesser. 
They are for breeding and serving, and that's what they're for. And he is in charge of them. They have no voice. So. Yes, at 12 years old, that takes place. That took place in my family as well, in all of our families. Yeah, at 12 years old, I can barely put one foot in front of the other. Yeah, but now at 12 years old, he has received his first initiation into narcissism. When we look at the Cody Brown family and we see the pain in the women's eyes, the public doesn't think beyond that moment of how they get along. Cody's lifestyle that he can spend, the time that he does with his wives and his children, is extremely unusual. Well, because he's got the money from TLC and he can do it. He's not working another job. Even the time he spends, and so the whole propaganda is so unreal to the average real polygamous family out there. And that's why people say, well, it's okay because he's making it. It's not okay because they're staying, because if they don't put on that show and succeed, they will not only be damned, they won't have any money or a way to make a living. Well, They're I mean, playing a part in a movie for a job. That's that's what the whole thing, I mean, that, that's where the public kind of falls down. It's like, you know, you see discussion groups and that, and, and oftentimes you'll see, oh, well, I don't like her, and I don't like her. And it's, and it's, it's you know, um, it's like you're watching, it's like they're commenting on a daytime soap opera. Um, only thing is, these are real people, and this is a real real occurrence. This is, these are children, these aren't actors who are playing a role. Um, they are scripted right. on, on the reality show. Make no mistake about that. Right. There are elements of that that are highly scripted. Right. Um, but, but in essence, you're looking at um, a, a, a so-called family unit, and one that is, is um, if you really examine what's going on in the show, uh, under a lot of duress. Exactly. And those kids don't have an opportunity. I mean, what kind of interactions does he have with the kids? Um, maybe occasionally he's a bit of a disciplinarian. Um, is there, are, are there loving moments that are shown? You know, the kids, the little girls they call the pixies, the other kids are kind of on their own. Um, and you don't really see what should take place um, between uh, father and, and child. Willie Jessup couldn't remember his wife's names. My father thought that he did good if he remembered a child's name or birthday. He did really well, and he was proud of himself. And this is more common than not. So where's the father? And the father, you're right about the dress. My sister, older half-sister, wrote a book about her father. She was the second child. Her father held her on his knee and paid attention to her when she was a little girl and played with her. I never knew that man. Never. By the time I came along, I had a father who was exhausted with the deeds he could not fulfill of all the women he was married to. He was exhausted with the chaos and just being in the presence, even though the children were extremely well behaved after being waterboarded. But he was just, didn't want to be around them. Too many wives, too many kids. He was totally unhappy. And fast forwarding it, honestly, it's rarely that you'll see a polygamous man over 45 years old that hasn't quit working, become the staff sergeant running his family out chasing skirts because there's too much chaos at home. Well, and, and, you know, these are the hazards that do not become a part of the show. I mean, you get this isolated little, little bit, you know, that is completely sanitized um, and described as lifestyle. Um, it's it's a fraud perpetrated by that network. Um, it's a fraud perpetrated by by the, the Brown family. Um, it's 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 a fraud perpetrated on us all, you know, um, who are not discerning enough to to look at it for what it is. 
um, you have to look past it. You know, you have to look past the the prurient interest of oh, this guy's got all of these wives. You know, gee, I wonder what that must be like. You know, and and you know, let's go beyond the titillation. Let's go beyond the sexual innuendo or attention that lies within the show because there's a lot of that. Um, let's get beyond the, the teeming jealousies that just are kind of right there below the surface that you see. Right. Let's get beyond the, the anger and the, the disappointment. And let's really take a look at what's going on here. Let's not be sucked into something that's artifice. Tell the public what usually happens ordinarily with women as they age as polygamous wives. What happens to older wives, Ed? They become really good at cooking and washing clothes. And what happens to their relationship with their It husband? completely deteriorates. They become kind of cast off and they become more and more of, of um, what you might call a mule. Um, they, they do all the heavy lifting. Um, they'll, they'll end up with more child-rearing responsibilities. They are pretty much discarded because if they're no longer fertile, then they're pretty useless because the whole purpose of it supposedly is to provide more little little babies to come down from the spirit world and, and propagate the earth and make the, the church larger. Um, their, their, their worth deteriorates. Um, it's kind of like being an actress in Hollywood, okay? Um, you hit 45 and you start to sag a little bit, and by God, if you don't have, if you don't have the, the the plastic work done, then you know you're you're done to down to doing the matronly roles. You're you're washed up. You're done. You're over. You know. Isn't it true in polygamy that the foundational belief of this religion is that a man must have X number of wives that are united? Because he's going to become a god. So the responsibility of making him a god is their unity. And if they don't behave, the whole family's going to be damned. And it's their fault. They've got to take him into heaven. And yet, on the reverse, they can't get to heaven without him. He's got to reach back and pull them in. Well, Explain how that works. Well, well, that's all part of the, the coercion and the belief system, you know. And that's how... That's how they're kept in line, the stay sweet business, o obedient thing, you know. Um, if, if, if you don't have that little blissed out smile, even if the eyes are sad and, and crying, um, if, you're, if, if you don't obey, if you don't, if you are not subservient, if you are not producing the, the baby a year or whatever, um, then you are hindering his advancement into the celestial kingdom and well you know it's like hooking a hooking a team of mules up to a wagon um if they go over the cliff they all go over the cliff you know if they go out to the pasture and get to enjoy life then they all do it it's not a matter of one or the other and, and it's it so everything depends on it and that's kind of kind of the way i think that they try to keep um the, the sister wives from killing each other, you know, they obviously don't like each other for the most part. I don't see them having healthy relationships. I think it, by nature we're all competitive to some degree, um, and uh, you know, um, and by nature we all want our own mate. Yeah, I mean that's 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 how we are, um, and and I think that that. That little seed of doubt, or that little anger, or that little whatever, um, is why so many look so miserable. The, the the situation for the senior centers becomes one of being financed and and, uh, and assisted by the by the government because they will need doctors and nurses, bedding, furniture, food, cooks, the whole nine yards to provide in there, and there is government assistance for setting up these senior centers. So that, that's another way of turning around and running a business without having to invest a heck of a lot. Um, we know that this is the sort of thing that's happened repeatedly. We had the situation up in, in York County, uh, Tom Green, who we've mentioned several times here, had, uh, had the thing nailed 
where he would set up daycare centers in, in his community that were, again, federally assisted, that were state assisted with chip, with, with food, with facilities, with equipment, with clothing, with all of the sorts of things that would go into having a daycare center. So, you know, you have one here, and then on the other side of town, you can have another one, and basically have the same kids going back and forth, because with phony birth certificates, you can do about whatever you want, and sort of double-dipping, you know, and, and continuing to, to take money from the system to support the private endeavor. And this is not only common, it's taught. It's taught, and, you know, the, the, other, the other part of it, to to expand a little further is that, again, these businesses, even the, quote, legitimate businesses that are, that are formed out there, as, as we've mentioned, they work as subcontractors to build schools, to build city offices, to build police departments, to build courthouses, to build facilities that are paid for with taxpayer money. Uh, there are companies out there that sign contracts with, with the Department of Defense, with the U.S. government. So, we, we are seeing that there are an awful lot of government dollars that are flowing into the system. And there's a lot of donated work for God flowing into the system, isn't there? Well, a lot of the people work for um, chits. They work for script. In, in lieu of being paid cash, you have so much that you can use to go to the store in the community and exchange your, your script. Most of the women that, that are employed out there in, in the various uh, companies are, are paid that way. They get script. They do not get paid in cash. They're paid in script, which is just basically kind of an IOU. It's a bartering system. Right. You know, this is good for sacks of flour or bag of beans or whatever it might be. Nice way to hide the money trail. Very nice way to hide the money trail. You know, if you got no overhead and you have no expenses, um, makes for a pretty nice profit margin. And you also have no employees if you don't pay them. Well, you have no employees if you don't pay them. And, you know, obviously they have to, to, to remain legit, work out some system where some are employed. But they do make contracts and they work for children without funds. How do they do that? Uh, very well. They... <laughs> Ed's continuing wisdom needs to be heard. I have followed this up by doing another interview with him back to back from the last one.